So good evening. Good Welcome. Evening. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Jerry Philogene, and it's such a pleasure to be part of this panel. Um, I want to thank you so much for coming to, uh, today as we discuss the work of Dizia William. Tonight we're joined by artists Colleen Asper and writer Dana Ngetsu, who will share with us their thoughts on Dizia's work. In addition, Dizia will share with us some of his thoughts on his recent body of work. As you know, there are two exhibits currently up. This one here is the Anna Zarina Gallery, Act Two, and the other one is at the James Fuentes Gallery, Act One. I encourage you to take the time to see both, if you have not already done so. This will give you a wonderful sense of DJ's current artistic exploration. I want to share with you before we begin and go to the main presentation, some of my thoughts and comments. I'd like to begin with you today by sharing with you some of my thoughts on the show. As I was thinking about this brief text that I wrote for the exhibition, I became interested in the idea of the gaze, both the look and the see. The agent of presence of the gaze, what I think of as the sea, S-E-E. -E. And what it might mean, its connotation when seeing necessitates a comprehension of a different linguistic space. A space we're not familiar with, a space that causes discomfort and is untethered from known linguistic comprehension. A seeing that makes us realize that our meaning making capabilities might not be sufficient to understand or return the gaze if we do not know the language in which it is given. I'm fascinated by the eye-shaped forms that are carved into the wood. Fascinated for two reasons. One, the idea of the gaze and the return of the gaze. I can't take my glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> who has the authority to return the gaze and who has the authority to actually give the gaze? and the complicated nature of looking. Because in looking, there is an acknowledgement of presence, there is an acknowledgement of an object. However, in seeing, that is where meaning making happens. It is in the gaze, it is the recognition of object to subject that seeing allows. And I think what we see in these works is a particular type of seeing. And I'm interested in the complexities of the seeing that we see in this body of I'm also interested in the idea of language, and that Didier has chosen purposely, purposefully to title all the pieces in Creole. Not French, not English, but Creole. We do not see that here because there are no titles by the pieces. However, that's the titles of the works are in Creole. A language that has its own fraught history, especially in the French Caribbean, Haiti to be specific. I just returned from a research trip in Martinique and Guadeloupe and some of the conversations I had with many of the artists revolved around national and cultural identity and language. The use of Creole, whom could speak it, when it could be spoken, in what context, formal or informal. I see Didier's use of Creole, as well as these eye-shaped forms, as moments of quiet, subtle transgressiveness. Inserting a scene, or as I write in the essay, a coup de jet, a sharp side-eye look, that at its boldest and most direct evokes the presence of bodies that were denied the right to look back, the right to speak in Creole. It inserts these bodies in spaces that were not made for those who do not belong and who are not supposed to look back, namely spaces like the canon of art history. These quiet, subtle, transgressive moments ruminate loudly as moments of refusal to be dismissed. Perhaps later we can uh, continue our conversation and we can return to some of the comments that I've made right now, as well as some of the comments my panel members will make. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers in the order in which they will present. They each have 10 minutes to share with us their thoughts, and then we'll have a conversation and later open it up for Q&A. And of course, definitely, definitely welcome your conversation with you, a conversation with you. First, Colleen Asper is an artist whose work has been exhibited widely in the United States and internationally. Including, including Galleria Anita Schwartz in Rio de Janeiro, Art Lab 753 in Puerto Rico, uh, Anahita Gap Art Gallery in Tehran, OED Gallery in India, <laughs> New Gallery in Paris, the Luminaire in St. Louis, and Noise Museum of Art in New Jersey, as well as the Queens Museum, Art in General, and the Drawing Center in New York. She's preparing for a show at 17 Exit, Ex Exis in New York and has stayed recently one and two person exhibi exhibitions at Venice.
venues that include Stellar Rays, PI, Seven Denim, and Art Production Fun Lab, all in New York City. And Stephen Wolf of Fine Arts in New York, I'm sorry, in San Francisco. Her work has been reviewed in publications that include Art Forum, Freeze, Art in America, The New York Times, The New Yorker, Time Out New York, and she's contributed to writings and publications such as Art Practical, The Brooklyn Rail, Laconian Inc., and Paper Monument. That's fine. Well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Danao Magetsu is a novelist and writer who has written three novels for which he has won numerous literary awards, including the Vilcek Foundation Award for Creative Promise in 2011 and the Ernest J. Gaines Award for Literary Excellence in 2012. He was named a 5 under 35 honoree by the National Book Foundation in 2007 and was selected as MacArthur, Foundation, uh, MacArthur Fellow in 2012. He has written for Rolling Stone on the War of War and for Jane Magazine on the conflict in Northern Uganda. His writing has also appeared in Harper's, The Wall Street Journal, and numerous other publications. Currently, he is the program director of Written Arts at Bar College. Welcome. And finally, we have DJ William. DJ earned his BFA in painting from the Maryland Institute College of Art and an MFA in painting and printmaking from Yale University School of Art. His work has been exhibited by the Bronx Museum of Art, the Museum of Latin American Art in Long Beach, the Museum of the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art, the Frankel Gallery, Frederick and Fra Fraser Gallery, and the Gallery Schutzer in Berlin. He was an artist in residence at the Mary Walsh Sharp Art Foundation in Brooklyn, New York, and has taught at the Yale School of Art, Vassar College, Columbia University, University of Pennsylvania, and SUNY Purchase. Currently, he is the Associate Professor of Art and the Chair of the MFA Program at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art in Philadelphia. Please help me welcome these three distinguished panelists. Like, wow, she looks like she could be my daughter, and then asked her if she would pose as the daughter of her. 
the, these photographs. And you know, I even had like in describing this work to a student, I had a student once who her art history teacher taught her that the kitchen table series was documentary photography. Um, but what I think is so fascinating about these photos is that they set up all these assumptions about the relationship between these three protagonists, and then like from image to image, they break it down. So who you assume you know, has dominance in one image is gonna totally change when you get to the next image. And so much of that labor of like setting up a certain idea about narrative and then like destabilizing or breaking down that idea happens through how she mediates the gaze of those three figures. Um, so, so yeah, it's just a total kind of destabilization of that idea of like the, the documentary photograph is like capturing the kind of image or capturing the <coughs> subject. Um, and you know, one last quote from that interview with, with Hux, she describes the kitchen table series as creating a space in which black women are looking back. So I wanna you know, use her to start with to talk about the way that you know, gaze certainly is this kind of axis of, of, of power and even of, of objectification, but it's also something that can be like, turned around, right? And that's very much what she's suggesting to me in those kind of images, how the gaze can be kind of turned back around. So then the next artist that I wanna briefly kind of touch on is Una Pizern. And Una Pizern, she's, um, it's interesting, she's of the three artists, she's probably the least well known. And she was also a writer, so um, I don't know, you know if you're familiar with her, but I sometimes find that people in, in kind of like literary circles know her work better than an artist do even. Uh, but she was a surrealist, and like a lot of the surrealists, she was interested in automatic processes. So her, her writing, for example, a lot of it was based on anagrams. Uh, but specifically, the process that she employed for making the drawings is she would let her hand kind of like hover over the page, and then without premeditating it, she would spontaneously just like plant, draw an eye, and then she said when the, the drawing was like looking at her, then it would tell her what to draw. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's just, just like amazing to think about as a process. But, you know, also thinking about that in terms of her, her kind of uh, position in her relationship with Hans Baumer, which is, uh, you know, I hate introducing the work of a few about artists, like she's the partner of a well-known male artist, but Unfortunately, a lot of us actually know her because she was, for the last 17 years of her life, she was Hans Bommer's partner, and she's actually the woman that appears in all the photographs that he took of found of the Avon woman was, you know, that was Nina Cern. And really, you know, very kind of ominously, when, um, when Hans Bommer first met her, he was quoted as saying, here's the doll. Um, so, you know, what I want to think about is this way that she describes her process as like a kind of submission to the page, right? In a way she's like giving over her agency to the page. And that is, you know, we can think about that as a form of like her becoming object or identifying with object or sort of giving over her power as subject. But that I really want to like posit that in her work that's a, a really positive form of alienation and that it allowed her to give image to these, you know, these doll-like bodies in her own drawings that have a, a kind of autonomy and um, an agency and even like visionary power that really Hans Bummer himself always withheld from his depiction of, um, of bodies. Um, so, so yeah, so then thinking about her and this sort of like lineage of the, the gaze that I'm trying to build, I'm really interested in the way, you know, we think about the gaze is so bound up with ideas of objectification, and it is, uh, but it's also a way that we can think about the object looking at. Right? Like the, the, the object can have power over the subject, and I think that's very much what um, her work is about, and what you know, the, a lot of the kind of surrealist attempts to to make work outside of conscious thought was about. Right. So last in my, my kind of trio, um, leading up to the work at hand, is Joan Jonas's Mirror One piece, and that was a piece that was originally staged in 1969, and I think there's a photo of it in the brochure from that um, original performance, and then she restaged it at several locations in 2010, so there's also um, some images from that as well, which I really love because the the age of all of the performers um, is the same. Like, she, when she staged it in 2010, she also worked with, you know, largely performers that were in their 20s, as she herself was in, in 69, and then she's also a performer, so you can kind of see her Sort of age and her body change. 
through the, the kind of progression of those two performances. But so in this performance, she, she and all the other performers are holding these, um, these body size mirrors, and they use it to reflect the audience back onto themselves, and they also use it to, uh, to multiply and to, to break down and fragment the bodies of the performers themselves. Um, and that, the, the performance begins, Mayor One begins with her, with Joan Jonas, actually reading every quote in Borges' Labyrinth that has the word mirror in it. So I'm just gonna give us one of those, there are many. Mirrors and population are abominable since they both multiply the numbers of man. This is such an amazing quote. Um, and there's obviously many ways that we could kind of think that, but in, you know, in this particular political moment, like the first thing that kind of comes to mind for me is thinking about all the, the sort of like rhetoric around uh, a fear of the multiplication of the body, right? The bodies need to be partitioned and controlled and walls need to be built to hold, hold them um, and so on. And thinking about the way that Joan Jones's mere one is like an absolute you know, negation of any idea that the multiplication of bodies can be controlled, right? And, and really specifically that she you know, she really uh, complicates any understanding that we might have our of ourselves as spectators, as passive. So, you know, you go to see this performance and you're sitting, you know, I'm saying this, it's really ironic because I'm like, talking to an audience. <laughs> you know, so it's like you're, you know, you come to see a panel and you're sitting in the chairs and we're all here talking, but, you know, at some point you're going to become part of the conversation, right? And that sort of divide is going to switch. In her performance, she, she, you know, she flashes these mirrors and it's really amazing I've seen documentation of it, I've never seen it in person, to see the way different people react to that. Like some people, when all of a sudden their body is included in the performance, they're all like, you know, kind of like looking away. And in one um, video I've seen of the performance, there's like a little girl who just starts like waving, you know, she's so like delighted to have her image included in the performance. So she's really breaking down this way that we think of the, the spectacle as something that if we're spectators, that we're safe from, and we can just kind of be a passive audience to have a sort of passive gaze. And she really um, gives image to the way the, the spectacle can also like look back at you and include you in ways that you didn't expect. So, so yeah, those are the, you know, the three sort of touchstones on different ways of thinking about the gaze and how the gaze, you know, the gaze is almost hinged is the way I like to think about it, right? Like we think it's coming from one direction and then all of a sudden it flips. Um, so with that in mind in, you know, kind of moving to, to Didier's work, you know, part of what I've been trying to do in, in talking about those artists is like have an argument with the idea that the gaze is monomocular, right? That the gaze is stable and fixed. And obviously, you know, these paintings too, I would say, are having an argument with the idea that the gaze is monomocular. And in, you know, in thinking about this work and, and thinking about this conversation today, I actually ended up ended up thinking about something that I had written, you know, maybe like five years ago before this work even existed. Um, so it certainly wasn't directly in response to the work, but now kind of retroactively seems to me that it, it was. So this is um, from an essay I wrote for a practical, you know, which I was talking about censorship and things that, um, you know, kind of go beyond the sphere of the, the quote that I'm, I'm reading you, but the, the quote I was trying to think through Lacan's idea of the gaze as, as a kind of site of anxiety. So some, some of the language in here might be a little Lacanian and weird. <laughs> so I can unpack it if you see it. Um, if beyond appearance there is nothing in itself, there is the gaze, so that's the Lacan quote. The subject enters the symbolic order through understanding itself as an image, something that can be seen and inscribed in language. But this understanding has the quality of a finely woven fabric. Its substance is built around many tiny holes. The subject desires to look and be looked at, but the gaze convokes the void. The fabric of the symbolic contains everything but the real, these holes, so the real remains as its radical absence, appearing only to negate the symbolic. The subject is thus split. The gaze becomes a source of anxiety as it carries with it the threat of all, nothing itself, that lies beyond sight. So you know, my attempt to kind of figure out a way to, 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 to describe, to visualize Lacan's idea of the gaze was this idea of like a cloth that covers the subject, or a subject that's kind of made up of a cloth, and that cloth is the symbolic. It's all the names and you know, and language and image that we use to give ourselves identity. But that that you know that cloth has a kind of warp and weft, and through that warp and weft is is everything that's not captured by the symbolic, like 
everything we can't give name to, um, everything that sort of slides out of it. And you know, again, like in thinking about that image, I was, I was so struck and, and thinking about these paintings, how they feel like bodies that are draped in, you know, this sort of this cloth that is, is literally, you know, falling apart, and all these kind of eyes are proliferating there. Um, you know, and Jerry just touched on this in, in, in her generous introduction to the panel. That she also touches in the essay that she she wrote for the PR on this idea that these are bodies that kind of slip away from any known identifiers of, of race, of gender, of age, um, even of like single bodiness, right? Like you can't say where the body begins and where the body ends. And that's really, you know, another way of sort of saying that they slide away from known symbolic structures. Um, and that happens, you know, I, we've been talking a lot about the gaze and that clearly happens in the use of the eyes, but for me it also happens in the, the stage, which feels really hinged to me, like it's always, it's almost like a trap door, like you think you're watching, but then all of a sudden you're being watched. Um, it happens for me in the contours of the body, which feel, you know, that again, like you can't, they, they refuse boundaries, right? You can't say where they begin and end. It happens for me in the pattern, which is, um, which is actually this place where all these other bodies kind of appear. Um, so, so with all that in mind, I wanna end with one last quote, uh, which is, Fred Moten, and this is from, this is like from the very beginning of In the Break, uh, because I really love the way it succinctly talks about the gaze not just as a possessive force, but also the gaze as a dispossessive force. While subjectivity is defined by the subject's possession of itself and its objects, it's troubled by a dispossessive force that objects exert, such that the subject seems to be possessed, infused, deformed by the object it possesses.
and that makes the body also the only repository of trauma. Yeah. So whatever comes with that is <coughs> oftentimes the process of migration is a source of trauma. It is very much um, the, the way in which we navigate and cross borders, but it's also the pain that we take in doing so. And so when we end up on the other side of those frontiers, all of the damage, all of the wounds that it takes to do that are actually carried over, um, but all the things that we love and perhaps are shaped and formed as well I don't want to limit it to that idea as a, as a sort of traumatic space, um, but it is a complicated space in migration. Um, and the second space I was thinking of it is the way in which, <clears throat> um, specifically the black body, this is something that I think um, is very important right now to African American and black writers and black poets, is the way the black body has been represented um, historically and the attempt to see if through language that can be somehow through the act of writing, through the act of imagining, we can actually reclaim the way that language has often distorted and framed the body, um, and the black body in particular, into things that we don't understand or recognize it to be. And so um, I'll read a poem by Gunderson Brooks that I think is one of the early attempts to do that. Um, but it's been something that I think writers have actively um, working towards, and it's a process that never ends, I think, because with every attempt to reclaim to restate the way the body is perceived, the way the body is narrated. There's a larger cultural discourse that persists in actually maintaining um, a linguistic tradition that defines the black body as a problem, as a source of violence, as a source of danger, or as a threat. Um, and then the third one was actually the way that which the body actually exists and continues to persist in those spaces. Um, and I wanted to, um, Try to highlight those points by um, reading three little different excerpts. Um, the first excerpt is only because Marie asked me to take something of my own work, um, otherwise I was really happy to not do that. But, um, um, is from is from a, uh, my second novel, um, and it's about the narrator's father and the journey that he makes from Sudan to America. And in order to make that journey, he has to contain himself into um, a box, and that box is on a boat, and that boat travels from Sudan to America. And there's something about the physical transformation that his body is forced to make in order to endure um, that passage, which has delivered echoes to um, the transatlantic passage, of course, that slaves made from Africa to America. Um, so this is that my yeah that body in migration. Um, for one week, he walked he walked west. He had never been in this part of the country before. Everything was flat from the land to the horizon, one uninterrupted stream that not even a cloud dared to break. The fields were thick with wild green grass and bursts of yellow flowers. Eventually, he found a ride on the back of a pickup truck already crowded with refugees heading toward the border. Every few hours, they passed the village, each one a cluster of thatched roof huts with the dirty road, with the dirt road carved down the middle where children eagerly waved as the refugees passed, as if the simple fact they were traveling in a truck meant they were off to someplace better. When he finally arrived at the fort town in Sudan, he had already lost a dozen pounds. His slightly bulbous nose stood in stark contrast to the sunken cheeks and wide eyes that seemed to have been buried deep above them. His clothes fit him poorly. His hands looked larger, the bones were more visible. He thought his fingers were growing. At least once or twice a week, Abraham would pick my father up from his room and walk him down to the docks in order to explain to him how the fort really worked. The only lights they saw came from the scattered fires around which groups of men were huddled. Abraham came by almost every day to share a cup of tea shortly after the evening prayers when hundreds of individual trails of smoke from the campfires wound their way up into the sky. He would pinch and pull at my father's waist as if he were a goat or a sheep and then say, what do you expect? I have to check on my investments. Afterward, as he was leaving, as he was leaving, he always offered the same simple piece of advice. Stretch, Yosef. Stretch all the time until your body becomes as loose as a monkey's. In the course of several evenings, Abraham worked his way down the line of boats docked from the harbor. His favorite one, he said, were those near the end. Those ships over there, all the way at the end, those are the ones you need to think about. Those are the ones that go to Europe. You know how you can tell? 
Look at the flags. You see that one there with the black and gold? It goes all the way to Italy or Spain, maybe even France. Some of the men who work in it are friends of mine, business associates. You can trust them. They're not like the rest of the people here who will disappear with your money. After that night, my father began to take seriously Abraham's advice about stretching. He worked his body into various positions that he would hold for 10 or 15 minutes and then for as long as an hour. At night before he went to bed, he practiced sitting with his legs crossed and then he stretched his back by curling himself into a ball. After four months, he could hold that position for hours, which was precisely what Abraham told him he would need to do. Um, and then I wanted to see if I can then narrate that other problem. Um, the body is something that we're actively trying to re, um, to refigure, to, to, to see if we can also note, um, I think, the fallacy and the problems that come with that sort of external gaze. And this is um, from Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, and it's from her poem that she wrote called The Bronzeville Mother Loiters in Mississippi While a Mississippi, while a Mississippi Mother Burns Bacon. Um, and I think even without reading just a small excerpt of the poem, the context in which the poem is written will probably become clear, but if not, I'll maybe narrate it uh, afterwards. Um, and this is from the point of view of uh, the white mother um, in Mississippi. Herself, the milk-white maid, the main mild of the ballad, pursued by the dark villain, rescued by the fine prince, the happiness ever after, that was worth anything. It was good to be a maid mild. That made the breath go fast. Her bacon burned. She hastened to hide it in the Stefan can and drew more strips from the meat case. The eggs and sour milk biscuits did well. She set out a jar of her new paint preserve. But there is something about the matter of the dark villain. He should have been older. The hacking down of a villain was more fun to think about when his menace possessed undisputed breadth, undisputed height, and a harsh kind of vice. And best of all, when his history was cluttered with the bones of many eaten knights and princesses. The fun was disturbed, then all but nullified, when the dark villain was a blackish child of fourteen, with eyes still too young to be dirty and a mouth too young to have lost every remainder of its infant softness. That boy must have been surprised, for these were grown-ups, and grown-ups were supposed to be wise, and the fine prince and that other, so tall, so broad, so grown. Perhaps the boy had never guessed that the trouble with grown-ups was that underneath the magnificent shell of adulthood, just under, waited the baby full of tantrums. It occurred to her that there may have been something ridiculous in the picture of the fine prince rushing, rich with the breadth and height and mature solidness, whose lack in the dark villain was impressing her, confronting her more and more as this first day after the trial and acquittal wore on, rushing with his heavy companion to hack down, unforced, that little foe. And the last um, text that I was going to sort of pair with that. Um, this is from Darren Wilson's testimony, um, the transcript from um, following the shooting of Michael Brown. I felt that another one of those punches in my face could knock me out or worse. I mean, it was, he's obviously bigger than I was and stronger. I tried to hold his right arm and use my left hand to get out to have some type of control and not be trapped in my car anymore. And when I grabbed him, the only way I can describe it is I felt like a five-year-old holding on to Hulk Hogan. Holding on to a what? A Hulk Hogan. That's just how big he felt and how small I felt just from grasping his arm. He turns and when he looked at me, he made like a grunting, like aggravated sound and he starts and he turns and he's coming back towards me. His first step is coming towards me. He kind of does like a stutter step to start running. 
When he does that, his left hand goes in a fist and goes to his side. His right hand goes under his shirt and his waistband. And at this point, it looked like he was almost bulking up to run through the shots, like it was making him mad that I'm shooting at him. Um, I chose those three because I think there's something um, obviously problematic that persists with us in how we continue to imagine, how we continue to think of what the black body is and how um, it can be at once a source of threat, something that is dangerous to us. Um, Darren Wilson was six foot two and he's imagining this 17 year old child um, as a Hulk Hogan. Um, that Gwendolyn Brooks poem was being narrated from the point of view of the woman who is responsible for Emmett Till's death. Um, and in that narration, there's Gwendolyn Brooks imagining what it must have taken this woman to picture this child as a threat to her. So that child needs to be turned and transformed into something else. He needed to be turned into a dark villain. He needed to be turned into something slightly monstrous, slightly, something slightly dangerous. Um, and yet at the same time, we also know that none of those images are sort of real, right? None of those worlds are consciences or fantasies. Um, and one of the things I think that art tries to do, or at least that we um, continually insist on its capability, is to resist and if not challenge, if not alter, um, then perhaps maybe even entirely ignore and create realities and aesthetics that are not defined by what the <coughs> external gazes may say we are or what we look like, and to see if something other than that can emerge. Um, so in looking at the DA's work, I find myself very much um, considering those implications about what it meant um, to have that body represented um, with a kind of strength and with um, something that does not allow for an easy containment, something that doesn't allow the viewer or the spectator um, to lay claim over and say this is what the body is. And for the body to also exist in a tradition and in a context that's very particular to it, that makes it almost somehow independent, if not free, of what um, we may assign to it, regardless of we are viewers. Um. <laughs> Singular and standalone. 
Um, and all of that was, was fine, but there was a kind of rationale and a kind of logic about space uh, and about composition that made no sense for what I was trying to talk about. Um, I grew up in Miami, Florida uh, with three older brothers and my parents, and we moved to the States from Haiti. And so my life in the early 90s and 2000s in Miami was composed of phone calls with uh, family in Haiti, being in the States and constantly having to negotiate phone calls with INS about immigration and whether I would be able to stay in the country, going to school and uh, being with kids who were American and spoke perfect English, um, being at home with my parents who had their own sort of relationship to the country that I was trying to negotiate. So the idea of painting stable, sort of whole, dissolved spaces that somehow represented my parts of my life just felt completely disingenuous and dishonest. And so the function of stability in my work uh, felt like it was coming out of nowhere and I had to get rid of it. Um, and I spent a period making these paintings that were inverted. I was working on the ground, a la Helen Frankenthaler and Morris Lewis, and kind of a direct abstract expressionist tradition. And pouring paint and moving paint around and kind of responding to the material and in many ways negotiating and collaborating with climate, with the environment, with the weather, and hoping that the paint would do what I wanted it to do. But because so much of the process depending on me leaving it alone, I could come in the next day and it would have shifted and slid and dried strangely and puckered when I didn't want it to. And I had to sort of figure out a way to build that language, that impromptu language, into my practice. Um, and this painting happened during that time. And it was the first time I was beginning to sort of engineer this language of the body in the work um, that was degendered, that was beginning to sort of even attempt to talk about this space in between gender binaries. Um, and the title, I remember when I was a little girl, came from what I really, it, it actually comes from, from two locations. Um, the first one, uh, oddly enough, is actually a reference to the Golden Girls. Um, <laughs> that's right, we went from Lacan to Golden Girls. <laughs> um, but that's not all odd, you know, do you know? <laughs> But um, it's for women in their golden years who have, are developing their lives outside of their identities as wives and mothers. So the kids are all grown up, and their husbands are either past or they're divorced. And the four of them are now roommates in Miami, Florida, oddly enough, the exact same neighborhood that I grew up in. Um, and they're living their lives. However, um, the show was written with a level of progressive social politics that was remarkable. So they dealt with everything from intimacy and sex in golden years to uh, Reagan's policies to um, work, trying to find work in, in your elder years to uh, poverty to same-sex marriage to interracial marriage. I mean, they covered so many different areas that were absolutely remarkable and that most production companies wouldn't read like in 2018. Um, and there's four of them, Sophia, who elder of the group, uh, Rose, who is the kind of uh, lovable half-wit from St. Olaf, um, Blanche, who is the sort of southern belle, uh, who they consider to be somewhat of a strumpet, um, and, and, and Dorothy's Bornat, who is the kind of crude, uh, uh, clumsy, she, she never has a date, she's always her head buried in a book, and Dorothy was, if you, you know, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the author who was played Maud. She was tall, broad shouldered, deep, raspy voice. Um, sort of an absolutely brilliant character, but everything about her identity and her body sort of refuted the other girl's identities or the other girl's constructions of femininity, uh, particularly Blanche's. I, I felt like her and Blanche narratively were sort of paired off against one another. And as a kid, I had this voracious appetite to consume all things American. Between myself and my brothers, I accent for kids that I sort of acculturated to this country much faster than my brothers did. Um, and Dorothy's born at B. Arthur was the first sort of American icon, the first quintessentially American body that I could identify as queer. And I didn't have a language for it at the time, but I knew that whatever she was, however she presented, this was a body that had its own opacity that deliberately and intentionally refuted these kind of 
conventions of gender, and I identified with it right away. And when the girls would sit down at the kitchen table and talk and chat, they would all tell stories about their lives and their lives as mothers and their lives as, as wives. And they would all begin with the same uh, sort of intro to their stories. Sophia would always say, uh, picture in Sicily, referring to things that happened back in Sicily. Rose would say, back in St. Olaf, uh, signaling to the girls that she was going to begin some tedious story about St. Olaf, Minnesota. Um, uh, Blanche would always say, you know, growing up in the South, and it always involved her sleeping with somebody. Um, and Dorothy would always say, I remember when I was a little girl. And there was something really remarkable about this, like, again, broad shouldered, raspy voice. Um, a deeply confident, stoic character forcing you, the viewer, to collapse what you were experiencing with her body with this image of a little girl. Um, that sort of severe discrepancy I found to be remarkable and brilliant writing, by the way. Um, so when I made this painting that intentionally was supposed to be this kind of iconographically, symbolically um, hybridized body, I immediately thought about uh, Dorothy's narrative. But I also, on some level, think about my own relationship with my brothers, I grew up in a house with primarily men, um, my dad and my two older brothers. And so masculine energy was, <laughs> it was never too far away and uh, performing a kind of version of masculinity was very much how we related to one another in our house. And my brothers are also this big, so we sort of grunted and bumped each other as a way of communication. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and they were fantastic, but certainly as we grew up and as you know our, our relationships developed, the worst thing you could do in our house was perform in any way that was remotely close to some idea of femininity. Acting like a little girl was like um, a mortal sin. And if we were wrestling, if we were fighting, if we were just sort of playing around and I got hurt or I got bumped or I threatened to tell my parents, if you would be immediately be admonished with, stop acting like a little girl. Um, that was like a mortal sin in, in our house. And, the painting really became a kind of meditation on, you know, what, what does it mean to sort of occupy that space and how does the mind and the body sort of uh, elastically bounce back and forth. Um, and around that time, a lot of the paintings were having that conversation with the body, with gender, with materiality. Um, and then I moved to this painting, uh, His Life Depends on Spotted Lives. And <clears throat> as um, Danau mentions, uh, Dan Wilson, Brown, this was a painting that happened um, simultaneously with the Trayvon Martin acquittal in the background. Um, I can't say that I was thinking deliberately or directly about Trayvon, um, but at the time I remember this kind of tension and this anxiety about bringing the body back into the paintings um, being really sort of on the surface and anxious for me. I, I was growing more and more tired of the previous work that preceded this kind of slipping away from the figure. I felt like it was a risk in not insisting that uh, my viewer engage with a body, a body that was present, a body that was forceful, a body that was, was active. And so I started to bring the figure back into the paintings and um, thought broadly and, and uh, a lot about what it would have meant for Trayvon to have some kind of camouflage that night. Um, he, his body was contained and sort of solidified in a particular way by George Zimmerman and being the threat um, as, as Danau just described. And what would it have what, what would have been necessary for him to be cloaked with some kind of camouflage that refuted George Zimmerman's gaze in that moment where George felt like um, Trevon needed to lose his life because his body had been rendered so um, uh, nefariously. And I started to make this portrait that I worked on in my Brooklyn apartment on my that carved it on my bed. Um, <laughs> moving the shavings off of it. And there was a kind of intimacy that I was having with the painting that almost necessitated repeating the eyes and the image. And almost almost as if I felt like my agency um, was a little bit too large of this figure and I had to give the figure back some of that agency and some of that empathy. So I carved eyes, filled the eyes in, into, uh, into the portion. This is actually the first painting that I carved anything onto, um, the, the very first one. Um, and the shadow was the first time that this appears in this, in this work, too. Um, and then the next painting, Two Dads. Um, I think at this point in my work, I was moving through various images, and the eyes were becoming really proliferated in the work. 
the eye motif as a sort of symbol of the gaze, the eyes as a way to, to Colleen's point, extend and expand the limits of the body and allow the body to be omnipresent. Um, I was sort of swimming in it at this point. And personal iconography, the personal biography was beginning to become more and more part of my practice. Much of the paintings in the current show um, intentionally combine a historical narrative with uh, a personal narrative. So for many of them, um, for many of them, there's some kind of symbolic moment that is sort of tied to historicity, um, but there's also, there's people at the door, but there's also, <laughs> um, but there's also this, this personal content that is sort of antagonizing and weaving its way into that. This was one of the paintings that really began that way of working to that. Um, and on a very sort of base, simple level, I was trying to make a painting that collapsed uh, the way I thought about masculinity in the bodies of the two people who are two of the most important people to me, my husband and my father. Um, if I could take this sort of idea of querying a body and, and take the two most closest uh, uh, bodies to me, approximately uh, close, closest bodies to me that represent that kind of masculinity, I could combine them, what would that look like? Um, my husband being himself a queer man and my father being this sort of emblem, this almost anthology of a particular kind of Caribbean man um, that is nothing, anything but queer. <laughs> um, and if I could take those two and, and conjoin them, what would that look like? What would it produce? What kind of hybridized body would it, would it enable? Um, and I found this image of my father right after Hurricane Andrew, uh, where Hurricane Andrew was a massive storm, decimated South Florida, flattened homestead, where most people were without power for weeks. Uh, and I found this photograph my mother took of my dad right after he finally was able to get propane and get uh, uh, the grill to work so he could cook. And he like, did a little dance, and my mom took a picture of him. Um, and you know, the picture just ended up in a briefcase somewhere. I found it about five years ago, and it was this picture of my dad sort of demonstrating a kind of flamboyant joy. And I had never seen any image of him like that before. My father was in the uh, Haitian military, he was in the Papa Ox military. Um, you know, he, his face always looks like this. Um, and, you know, to see him kind of demonstrating this particular kind of presence, um, this instantaneous presence at the moment was really odd and strange. And on an economic level, I felt like literally doubling that moment, literally doubling that space uh, into this image called Two Dads, um, simultaneously made space for my husband and his own subjectivity at the same time. Um, and to also bring in bring back in this idea of multiplying the gaze and multiplying the body through kind of ornamented uh, physicality of the work. And then the last image, um, Dantoa and Anais, which is the Madonna and Child figure, Madonna and Child painting right behind us, except in Haiti when the black Madonna and Child shows up, it is not um, Madonna and Christ, it's not Mary and Christ, it's Esli Dantoa and Anais, her daughter. Um, it's a painting that I made and thought about immediately after seeing this image of my mom in this beautiful sort of blue and gold dress. I was in Miami for work and I was staying in a hotel and she shows up. She has this long, beautiful, flowing um, blue pattern dress and has this gold collar on it. Um, and I didn't even know what I wanted to paint when she, when I got off the elevator and she was like standing in front of me, this sort of regal figure with this gorgeous, I just immediately took and this was, again, a couple years ago. Um, and then in thinking about this work, and then thinking about the role and the position of the Haitian Revolution, and thinking about Desi Lee as this sort of feminine, but also queer embodiment of everything that Haiti has been and Haiti has been through, Desi Lee's refusal, Desi mm -hmm. Lee's uh, omnipresence, Desi Lee's opulence, Desi Lee's queerness, um, it made sense to sort of collapse her and my mom in this space. And then also to even think about in, in Haiti, as Lee and Anais, uh, again, uh, the, the, the child in the painting is uh, her daughter, it's not Christ. So it, it becomes this sort of really interesting feminist perspective, uh, wherein you can only speak to as Lee through Anais. You can't speak directly to Esli, you have to speak through Anais, and Anais will uh, uh, translate. And Jerry, I think you mentioned this uh, in your uh, introduction, there's this way in which the body sort of collapse into one another in the work. Um, I remember in the beginning when I first started carving eyes, 
I sort of wrestled with this idea of trying to distinguish, particularly in paintings that were all eyes and no collage or no pattern, trying to distinguish between the eyes and trying to sort of make sure that the viewer can see the figure. And then I got really interested in this, the really fine space between um, this like traditional fig, uh, 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 figure ground relationship that allows the figure to project forward, um, but also the conceptual space that allows the figure to slip back into, um, uh, literally be camouflaged into the sort of multiplicity of eyes, uh, wherein if you, if you lose focus for a second, if you stop looking for a second, you might actually lose the demarcation between the figure in the background and between two figures. And that certainly happens in this one where um, Anais and, and Ezzini's bodies are so enmeshed in one another, that line of demarcation between them becomes actually quite difficult to see. Um, and I think this painting sort of occurring at the culmination of this show uh, and the show at James's gallery, um, I literally really thought about the, the sort of continuum of the narrative culminating with this image uh, of the Madonna and child. Um, Two or three paintings in that show that were in Creole, 
And um, my, when my parents came to the show, they loved all the work, they got excited about the work. But the two works that had Creole titles, they got very excited about it. They were laughing, they were sharing jokes with each other. Um, there was this immediate moment of connection, and I was sort of, I, I became aware of the ways in which they had a privilege that the rest of the audience didn't. Um, and, but even still, they were in the minority. And so in the conceptualizing this show, I wanted to make a show that reversed that, that allowed them to, have a, have, to be in the majority and have the privilege of being able to immediately connect with the content and to make the rest of my viewers work a little bit. Mm -hmm. Also because I think that's not dissimilar from the ways in which if you are um, if you are from another place, those of us who moved here from elsewhere, those first few years of acculturating to mm -hmm. this space means doing a tremendous amount of work to sort of catch up, to find the language, mm -hmm. figure out the jokes, figure out the humor, figure out the cultural references, figure out the euphemisms, and there's always this way in which you were deliberately and intentionally outside of those conventions of culture. Um, and in many ways, how could I make a space that made room for um, the conventional viewer to be outside of those conventions? Uh, there's a painting in the back room called Fais Bon Sa Rajon Pap Son Nair. You're the only one laughing. And you know, I can tell you guys, it translates into this phone has never not ringing. And I remember in the early 90s, um, we, this was before cell phones, so we didn't have, everybody didn't like have their own phone. There was like a phone, it was the phone. Um, and it was constantly ringing, and it was usually either my best friend Jules calling, or a, a girl from one of my brothers, um, or most often it was INS or the debt collector. Um, INS is Immigration and Nationalization Services, which is the office that preceded Homeland Security. And this was around the time we were applying for citizenship, and uh, I don't know if they still do it, but at the time you had to have a work authorization card, which, which came before the green card. So first you got your work authorization card, then you got your green card. Um, so we were always negotiating these like appointments with the federal government to decide whether we would be here. And because I was youngest, I think because I was the most anxious and most excited, I learned English the quickest of me and uh, my brothers. And so very quickly, I became like the phone so whenever the phone rang, someone would hand me the phone and I'd be like on the phone with an INS. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like 11. So um, you're like 12? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and so the phone really yeah. became like my part of my domain and, and it was this really interesting, um, complicated and, and fraught space. But you know, and now you uh, brought this up too. It, it, looking back on those moments, there's, it, it, it's not attached with this like, trauma. Uh, I think in many ways I and my family, many other immigrant families have to find a way to sort of claim agency over those spaces because they really become this way in which the transnational imaginary is built and sort of insisted. Um, No, it does. It really it does answer. It does the answer. You asked about the, the show titles too, right? Or right, right, right. I, I see the show, I see it as a kind of intervention. You know, right. you were saying in one in one sense it's a kind of discomfort. In the same way in which the the gays kind of and also the black body operates as a particular kind of intervention, but also a moment of discomfort. Yeah. So that kind of intervention is where I'm thinking of this kind of quiet moment of transgressiveness that yeah. I see very much happening in, in, in your work, and even in the poetry, in, you know, um, Wendell Brooks's poetry that you. Wrote, there's a quiet sense, a subtle sense of, of transgression in, in her work that's just, and then it becomes very powerful, you know, very powerful. So, yeah, I'm just thinking as you guys were talking about that. Do you want to comment on a question or whoever? I mean, just in hearing you speak, I was thinking back about a moment in your talk to now when you were saying, you know, there are so many ways these paintings refuse the language and yet. Here's some language. <laughs> but I actually think that like both ends are part of it. And that they it's like they refuse language, but they ask for language, they refuse the gaze, but they ask for yeah. the gaze. Um, and you know, to me that seems like a way maybe to talk about what you were saying earlier, Jerry, about there being this way that they, you know, they deny certain markers of race and gender, and yet, you know, in that denial, like inevitably, we will talk about race and gender. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, just thinking about all the ways for you know any marked body, it's like you feel both totally invisible, but also like hyper visible. And so thinking about all the strategies we then use to 
navigate that, you know, invisibility and hyper-visibility. Um, so yeah, I was just really, I was sympathizing with your, like, being, yeah, the dilemma. I think the dilemmas of the paintings themselves. Um, and and in, in terms of the question, of it's, it's, I don't, I, I, you know, it's, it's a hard sort of line, right, because I, I don't see them solely through the lens. It's not because I don't want to racialize the sort of, to suggest that somehow they can only sort of exist because to racialize something, you need to have an other, right? Mm -hmm. There needs to be a secondary perspective that then turns that into something outside mm -hmm. of itself. Um, and I don't think the works are dependent on that, right? They seem to sort of, they completely seem to be able to exist within their own space, and that space is free of conventions of gender, of form, of even sort of defining the limits upon what the body is. And I think within that expansive space that the images make, I think one of the spaces that they do allow them for is to exist beyond that narrow confine of race. Um, and yet at the very same time, I do think it's important to also for the space, for the images to also exist in their, comfortably in their own reality, right? I think it's very important for like, an Haitian image and references to that to also be comfortable being black. Um, I don't think that racializes it so much as it is allowing it to be exactly in the world that it belongs. Um, and that racialization is something that happens um, on the part of the viewer. Right, I don't think it's something that's sort of inherently and intense within the work itself. And that's, I'm, I'm glad you said that. I think that's that's how I would answer your question about the title of the exhibition, Jerry, mm -hmm. Curtain, Stages, and Shadows, um, which was something I sat with for a while, and then right before we were about to open the show, I texted an email to James and Anna and said, this is what I think the title should be. Um, and it was deliberately an attempt to not claim or not name the bodies and the images. I, I wanted to be direct in naming the stage that's like this repository for performativity and really like a, a sort of analogy and a um, substitute for gravity. I wanted to claim and name the curtain, which becomes this sort of barrier and this boundary that both uh, allows but also dis can allow or disallow the narrative, can uh, open the narrative but also close off the narrative. Um, I wanted to name the shadows, which sort of evidence a present body, but doesn't give you any kind of clear indication of that body, and allow the actual or perceived bodies, or the boundary bodies in the paintings to be left up to the viewer. I wanted that negotiation to happen only with the viewer, um, and let the rest of it sort of function as, again, a repository for this action, this event to take place. The culminating moment in the, moment in the work is when an attempt is made to either race the figures, or gender the figures, or sex the figures. Um, and thereby fall prey to this sort of curse of the gates at the same time. Um, at the other gallery, I was talking to someone who was visiting, and they said, um, well, these are clearly men, because women's bodies are not this muscular. And I was like, you haven't seen the women around. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, I love that explanation, because I think um, it goes right to the heart of why this kind of refusal takes place. What do, you, what do you guys think about the um, the different use of material in the work? You know, we have printmaking, we have painting, we have sand on top of wood. What do you guys think about the kind of multi-layeredness that occurs in these mixed media pieces? I mean, I think one way I would articulate that is that, you know, printmaking, for example, is a really deep, like, mediated process. Mm -hmm. I mean, the carving is very direct, but baffling to me, um, <laughs> it's really indirect. And it, so I think part of what that does to the work is like I feel strongly that I'm in the presence of something that was made and there's all this evidence of the hand, but then like I don't know how it was made. And you know, I think that's part of the, the seductive qualities of the work that sort of like draws you in, but then like, has this, you know, like B. Arthur um, kind of opacity at the same time, doesn't reveal itself. Um, for me was exciting because mm -hmm. print is where I figured out what to do with color. We talked about this a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think all the color classes in the world, you know, you barely scratch the surface of mm -hmm. how to use color and how to manipulate color. Color is hard. Yeah. Um, and the print shop made color the artist in the room or not. Yeah. The print shop <laughs> made color material, turned color into material. Um, and I think growing up in particularly a place like South Florida, Color was material. Color was like terracotta rooftops and lined walls, and you know, amazing food that was richly colored and flamboyantly um, dre 
affects men and women, and, and it, it was never something that needed to be dissected. It was just a fact of life. And it wasn't until I started um, forcefully combining pigment and uh, substrates in the print shop that I figured out the role that color needed to play in my paintings. Um, and then also, I think the way in which printmaking takes stratified labels <coughs> in there and combines them, but you can't, uh, the, the, in print, you can't separate them out. Everything is sort of always present at the same time. Um, and I really sort of resonated with that, both as a way of working, but also as a way of storytelling, as a way of narr narrating a, a, a content that there was my sort of lived experiences, the mythologies that um, uh, I was familiar with, the oratory that my parents um, sort of privileged when we were growing up, and then this like historical narrative as well. And all of those things kind of abut one another, but they never really fully and I think on a technical level, print does that as well. You're looking at pigment, but you're also looking at the tooth of the paper. You're also looking at the weft of the paper. You're looking at, you know, you're looking at all of the different processes that took place 